You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast, recorded live at our Manchester campus. For more information, visit audaciouschurch.com. How brilliant. We have had across Audacious Church this weekend we've had over 1,800 children, young people, young adults at all of our light parties, plus, plus, what happened to that? There's a space for you in our church, if you ever want it, even though you're broken, thank you. Plus all their parents and uh, gra- grandparents and all of that, and so we've had literally Almost 3,000 people come to Audacious Church for the first time this weekend. How good is that? Not even including today and not including this service. I would like to invite all of you to stand to your feet. For those of you who've never met me, my name is Paul. I am one of the pastors here at our church. And this is the moment in the service where we, let's go old school with our language, we come around the word of the Lord. Uh, I don't know what they call it in the church that you grew up in, the preach, the sermon, the word, the talk. I believe this is uh, described best as a message because it's something from the heart of God to you uh, through, you know, the medium of a preacher. But really, this is a message for you from God. So while you're standing, I'm going to read this account of a miracle where Jesus healed a blind man that the Bible says was blind from birth. Okay, it's in John chapter 9. It actually says John 1 on the screen, but that is my mistake. You know, when I was designing these slides, no, I wasn't. I put it wrong in my notes. John chapter 9, starting in verse 1, says this. As he went along, talking about Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed, key word, displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, the Bible says he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was and others said, no, he only looks like him. But the testimony that really mattered was he himself insisted, I am the man. How then? Were your eyes open, he asked, or they asked. And he replied, the man they called Jesus made the difference. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes. Then he told me to go and wash. So I went and washed. And then, and now, and forevermore, I can see. How good is that? The transformational difference that one encounter with Jesus, the King of Kings, the name above every other name can make, you go from being never able to see to being always able to see the difference that Jesus makes. Today's message is part of our series that Pastor Soph started last week. The series is called Therefore Go. Therefore go, taken from the Great Commission, these kind of closing final words of Jesus before he ascended up into heaven. He sent the disciples out and it starts with that phrase, therefore go. And we the church in 2024 are under and in and carrying and obeying the very same commission that we would go. The reason why I read this miracle is because I wanted to try and get practical today. Our message today is called deployment how to. Like how do we actually do it? Remain standing, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give this brief moment to you and ask that you would speak to us. I pray that 
No one will leave this room without having received something from you that is transformational in nature, motivational in its spirit, and actually leads to some kind of change in our lives. Throughout this week, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. I went to school in the 90s. I was at secondary school in the 90s. And just like every generation since the 50s before that, and every generation since that, I was convinced that the institutions were trying to teach me things that I would never need in my future life. Give me a wave if you have ever used your intimate knowledge gained at school on photosynthesis in your everyday life as an adult. Give me a wave. Shan has, good, good. She's probably a gardener. Anyone else? No. All right. How about if you have used algebra since the day you, why are you lying? No, you have not. You're a teacher, that's why. Of course you've used it because you've been indoctrinating our children. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Every day. You maths nerd. All right. What I'm trying to highlight is the futile nature of spending time learning, receiving, taking in something that has no relevance to your life going forward. And I pray that uh, all the teachers don't leave the church right now. You're wonderful and we love you. Thank you for helping our children know all about the water cycle and just how it happens with that whole rain and then the other bit where it goes up. Brilliant. Good job, teachers. Come on, clap for all the teachers in church. Well done. I don't know if you've ever uh, had the adverse, the opposite of that, where you learned something and you, you kind of in the moment didn't know, but then there came a moment when you were like, this is why I learned that thing right now. And that is a magical moment when you understand that knowledge is not just good for sort of, um, you know, filling up your brain, but actually it can be applied to your life. And Pastor Soph last week when she kicked off this series was talking about Therefore Go and she was also linking it to the purpose of our church. If you've been in church since the summer, you'll know that in September and October we did a whole other series uh, called From This Generation to the Next where we were refreshing and re-looking at the vision of our church, the purpose of our church, the cultural distinctives of our church. And we spent time looking at the purpose of our church which we said and reminded you was to display the supernatural God. That is why we exist as a church. And don't forget my slightly bad English phrase from my message in that series is that we are you. So you are the person that is displaying or is charged to display the supernatural God. And last week, Pastor Soph, if you didn't listen to the message, I recommend you go back and listen to it, uh, you know, through, through online or whatever, which is what I did. On Monday, I ran, and, uh, and when I was out for a run, I listened to Pastor Soph's message again, and she was talking about the word display, and how if you look at the Great Commission, therefore go... And especially some of the other words that follow, like go and make, go and baptize, go and teach, is very active. Whereas the word display, certainly at first glance, can appear a little bit passive. Like a display is like a, in a shop window, or maybe a poster on the side of a bus, or, or something, you know. But actually what Pastor Soph was teaching us is that there is a Three dimensional element when it comes to the displaying of the supernatural God for Audacious Church. In that we don't just display like flat, but we actually have um, that there's an action that goes with it. And she actually used the word deploy. When defining the word display, she helped us understand that there is a deployment to our displaying which is where the link comes with, therefore, go. And so I thought it would be good if we spent some time before we moved on in the series. Next week, we have a special guest. His name's Pastor Thomas Hansen, all the way from Denmark. He's going to preach to us about God coincidences. It's going to be absolutely brilliant. The week after, Pastor Joel is speaking really practically on just how to share your faith. Like, what do you actually do when you're trying to explain with words 
the transformation that's happening on the inside, like on the out, how do you do that? So we're going to do that. But I thought it'd be good if we just got a little bit practical off the back of Pastor Sof's message. Is that okay? So she said we are deployed and we were all inspired and we were all motivated, but I wanted to try and ground it and sort of bring it into sort of real life in the spirit of how I started with like learning something that you can then actually use. That is one of the reasons why we preach often in the style that we preach is because our, one of our goals with our preaching, one of our goals with our preaching is that we ground it we, we're growing in the timeless truth of the, of the Word of God. We're growing in it, but we're also grounded in it. So it's not just something that we know, it's something that we do. You know, it's something that we live. We're working out our salvation. We're, we're taking two steps forward and then one back, and then we're trying to figure it out as we go. So I thought it'd be good if we got practical, and that's why I read that miracle account where Jesus healed the man uh, blind from birth, because he is... Uh, deploying in that moment, and we could have chose one of many miracles, one of many interactions between Jesus and a lost and broken world and a generation that didn't know who he was or what he was doing. Like, we could have chose many, but this is the one that we chose because I think we need to get practical so that we don't just hear the word of God, but that we live the word of God on a Monday morning. According to Ephesians, according to Ephesians, the job of the gift, the ministry gifts to the church, the apostles, the prophets, even the teachers, right, is that they would equip the saints, that's like me and you, for work, for actually going out and living our lives. And so we'll do the deep study. Trust me, you have to trust me that it happens during the week. Sometimes we do it on a Sunday. Sometimes we do a deep dive and sometimes we go line by line and word by word. But even when we don't do that on a Sunday, it's happened during the week because we're trying to get to a place where we're not just growing in truth, but we're grounded in truth. So I noticed three things from this story, this account, excuse me, of Jesus literally setting the example of how do we do what Pastor Sof said last week, which is a three-dimensional display, more like a deployment, and therefore go. So three things. Number one, right? if you're writing notes, write number one. The first thing that I noticed about Jesus in this miracle that was three-dimensional, it took it from, from words to action. It took it from a, a visual kind of like something that you might watch to something that's interactive and there's, there's like some friction, there's some traction, is compassion. Compassion. We are called to be people who look at life through the lens of, of compassion. Listen to the words. The Bible takes the time to mention that Jesus saw the blind man. That's in verse one, right at the beginning. It suggests to me that perhaps others didn't see the blind man. You can imagine the scene like a busy Saturday afternoon on Market Street, people, you know, hustling and bustling and all sorts of stuff going on, noise, sound, wherever Jesus was, there was a party because there was people who were either desperate for a miracle or living in the fruit of a miracle. So they were either celebrating with tears of joy or crying with tears of desperation. That's why, you know, when you hear the sound, when you hear the stories of Jesus coming into a town, everybody knew when Jesus was coming into a town, not because he was insecure and shouting all that but because the difference that he had made in people's lives was undeniable you know that story where Jesus is walking into a town and there's a funeral coming out something's going to happen so anyway Jesus is walking and there's all sorts of stuff going on but then the you can imagine the the, the blind man who's begging is probably on the ground and people just walking past walking past and the bible says Jesus saw him and so the conversation changed. It would have been about, okay, where are we going? What's next? And what's the plan? And when we're going to overthrow the Romans? And what's the situation? And you're the best. And all, you know. And then the conversation changed to talking about this man. Because the disciples were like, oh, how come? Like, we've heard. We've just done some investigating. And we've just found out that this guy's been blind. So the conversation changed because Jesus saw through the lens of compassion. The problem for us is that we see everything through the lens of our own brokenness. You ever looked through some broken glasses or some dirty glasses and things are not how they seem because it's distorted by the lens through which, which you look. 
And so it's all very well us saying on this practical sermon, in this practical message, this deploying message that we need to have compassion, but how do we? Because we look through the lens of our brokenness, but compassion is a different type of lens, and compassion causes you to see what other people don't see. Everybody walked past the blind guy. Everybody was like he was an inconvenient distraction. But Jesus saw him and he's actually calling us when he said, therefore go in Matthew 28. He's actually calling us to do what he did. He actually said, you'll do greater things than what I have done. And so therefore we have to put on a new pair of glasses. And in order to do that, Here's the practical bit, because this is still a bit ethereal, like, okay, I'll try and be more compassionate. No, we actually have to ask for the Holy Spirit's help. Jesus said, I'm going. The only reason the disciples saw the blind man is because Jesus saw the blind man, and they were with Jesus, and that's why they felt indestructible. But after he was arrested and then crucified, their hearts were broken, but then he was raised from the dead, and they were like, we are undefeatable, not even death, and Jesus said, I'm going. And they're going, what do you mean you're going? He said, no, I'm going to leave a helper. And the helper we know, because we've read the book of Acts, was the Holy Spirit. And so for me and you to look at life through the lens of compassion, we cannot do in our own strength. I've said this to you before, and at the risk of repeating myself, the fruit of Paul Reed is lazy and selfish. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, We could go through the list. And so therefore, if I want to try and do this in my own strength, then the lens through which I will see the people that God has put around my life, my work colleagues, my friends, my family members, boxing day with the in-laws through the lens of broken glass might be a, (sighs) to some, not me, of course. I love your mum. But actually what we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit, will you help me? And this is a possibly even twee expression, not because it has no power, but because it's possibly been overused or it sounds a bit traditional. But we have to pray the old prayer of God, help me to see as you see. Help me to see things as you see them. That's what the disciples did in that moment. Jesus saw the blind man. And so all of a sudden, the lens through which the disciples were looking at the blind man was changed to that of compassion. You see, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. But compassion is the supernatural gift from God to help us. Because how we are determines how we see. And I need God's help because if not, I'm gonna miss the opportunities of God. So right now, I want everybody to stand to their feet and we're gonna pray now for something of a deposit of the Holy Spirit on each one of us in this service that we, from this moment onwards, like a wedding day, from this day forward, we will now see through the supernatural lens of compassion that is is going to remove the the broken lens and bring clarity. So if you're comfortable and the person next to you doesn't slap you around the face, put your hand on their shoulders. Please give me a wave if you did get slapped, that would be funny. And for 60 seconds, I want you to pray for the person either side of you. If you're not familiar with praying, you don't normally pray, that's fine. You could just stand and, and someone could pray for you. But right now we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that from this moment forward, you would supernaturally, you would give us a new lens through which to look at the fabric of our everyday lives. The people, the places, the projects, the, 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 the ingredients that make up our life. We want to see them as you see them. We need your supernatural power uh, to, to help us live and be led and keep in step with your spirit. Save us from trying to do this in our own strength. Thank you that you're calling us to go, but you're equipping us as we go. And so we're going to see people at work tomorrow different. We're going to see our family from now on different. We're going to see our friends, our mates at uni, our people at school. We're going to see them different because we're going to see them through the lens of compassion. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can take your seats. The second thing, (laughs) thank you. I don't know who we're applauding, but I'll, I'll receive. The second thing about this story, 
and they kind of go in order because compassion always leads to action. The second ingredient is what I've called interaction. So if we're going to be deployed, we're going to basically do the therefore going of Matthew 28. If we're going to do that, we're going to need the, the lens of compassion, which we need to receive daily from God. So that prayer was a, was a catalyst but actually, it's a daily habit that we need to get into of actually praying that prayer. God, help me to see as you see. But compassion always leads to action. That's how you know it's compassion. Because if it's just a little bit of emotional kind of like a, a tugging on the heartstrings, then it's probably possible for you to just kind of pocket that and just ponder that and just move on in your life. But if you are compelled by compassion, something happens where you have to move. There has to be an interaction. It was undeniable that Jesus had interacted with this guy. He had mud, saliva, dripping off his face. He wasn't like, I'm not sure if I just interacted with Jesus. Like I had, had a few goosebumps and like a little bit of like, you know, the hairs on my arms. No, no, no. It was, un, like, it was obvious. You could not deny there was an interaction. And the problem we have, I think, in a contemporary society and, and with a contemporary, if, if you can sort of forgive the, the language, a contemporary style of faith. You know, we're trying to make sure that people know that God is relevant and, you know, we're trying not to be sort of old-fashioned and stuffy. We're trying to be contemporary and trendy and you're looking at me saying, you're not trying very hard, really. Um, but what I'm saying is, in, in, in an attempt to do all that, what we can actually do is, is compartmentalize our lives and faith becomes, you know, one box out of a, a whole array of boxes and that certain situations require the faith box and some don't. So like a Sunday morning, let me just encourage you to bring your faith. And, and I hope you do. And there are people that don't. So that might be a lesson for us, right? There might be certain situations. Maybe it's like before you eat, right? We're, gonna, we're just gonna thank Jesus for the food. And so we get the faith box out and we do this. And maybe it's at certain times and if someone gets sick or whatever. But actually, faith is not a component in your life. You don't, you don't just go to the church. You are the church, Faith is, is a, a, it's a new identity. You know, the Bible says you're a new creation. When Jesus said, therefore, go, make disciples, that's a verb, right? Do something. And then it says, baptize them. Bapti baptism is a picture of a new beginning. So you, you didn't have faith, but God put saving faith in you, and now you're growing in your faith. And I feel God is charging us to allow the people that he's put in our lives to interact with our faith, to step out and say, can I pray for you? To step out in faith and say, well, you know what? I believe that eternity is real and that God loves you so much that he doesn't want to spend eternity without you. I know I've got some flaws and I've got some mistakes because that's the other problem when it comes to in people interacting with our faith is we think we've got to have it all together. And let's face it, being a Christian is not a, an antidote to bad things happening, right? And we can sometimes get caught in the trap of like, you know, faith is, is denial that, that, that bad things happen or the absence of bad things. And so when my life's all sorted, then, you know, I'll, I'll maybe be a person of faith. No, 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 right now, wherever you are, whether you're living in the, in the, uh, in the revelation of the crucifixion, in other words, the, you know, the, the, the challenges of being a person of faith. You know, when you, you're picking up your cross daily and you're, and, and you're dying daily and, and all of that, or maybe you're right now in a season where you're living in the revelation of the resurrection, that God is good and, and all of that. But the thing is, the res resurrection is only the resurrection because there was a crucifixion. And so we've got to live with the tension of both and recognize that there isn't a day coming uh, except for when Jesus returns or we go to be with him, there isn't a day in this life when everything's going to be what we call hunky-dory. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be a challenge, and that's okay. Jesus' interaction with this blind man was unexpected. It was inconvenient. I learned yesterday that the Greek word 
go in that Matthew 28, therefore go, has a few meanings. Some of them are obvious, some not so much. It means to go, it means to go away, it means to walk, but it also means to die. And so when Jesus is saying, therefore go and make disciples, he's saying, therefore die to yourself, be inconvenienced, walk through the challenges and and all of that and go the long way round when you could have gone the shortcut. Don't just choose the path of least resistance, but go and make disciples. It was unconventional. Maybe it would be weird for you, especially after being at that workplace for the last five years, to all of a sudden go, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Maybe that would be unexpected, but we've got a choice right now. In, 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 in the first Sunday of November, as we're racing towards Christmas, and we have all of this opportunity where we're going to be able to say to people, let me tell you about the Jesus that was born on the front of your Christmas card, grew up to be an adult and died on the cross, and he's changed my life and he's going to change yours. We either take it now, or we go round for another year. And we go round the thing and we go, next year I'm going to have the confidence. Or we just say, you know what? I am audacious. I am bold. I'm daring. I'm cheeky. I'm unrestrained by convention. And my job is to display the supernatural God, not in a little subtle hidden way, but actually in a in a visible, undeniable, almost like you've got mud and spit dripping off your face kind of way. Interaction. Your faith was never meant to go away with the Christmas decorations. It's supposed to be something that you wear, the robe of righteousness, something that you put on every day. And when you go into, there's no such thing as a secular environment. Secular means void of God. And if you are in it, it isn't void of God because you carry the presence of God where you go. Now you might be the only Christian in the village. And, and, and feel outnumbered and a little bit insecure about, well, what will everyone think? But let me tell you, you plus God is always more than anything else. Compassion always leads to some kind of action or interaction. But the third point that I want us to do, and we're going to stand and pray together in a moment, is the power of invitation. Jesus said, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. There's something of a recurring theme. When Jesus heals somebody, there's a miraculous interaction between a person and Jesus, between like no faith and faith, and it's a sending of to tell others about it. Even when Jesus expressly said, don't tell anybody, they still were caught by some kind of spirit that made them go and tell. You know, remember the woman at the well when Jesus interacted with her and and had this amazing conversation and it changed her life? The Bible says that she went into the city and she said, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. This guy was sent by Jesus to a pool to be washed so that he might interact with people who said, aren't you the blind man? And some people said he is, and some people said he he, he just looks like him. But I love the words where it says, but he himself said, you can argue with theology if you want. You can argue whether of style and preference is good. By the way, the prerequisite for flourishing in church is not preference, it's being planted. So sometimes we have to suspend our preferences, not always, but sometimes we do for the greater good. And the greater good might be your kids, it might be your spouse, it might be the word of God just telling you to do it. It could be a thousand things. But anyway, an invitation from a planted person has more potent power than one that doesn't. Um, What am I talking about? Yes, invitation, good, yeah, I knew that bit. Yeah, on, on your seat, there's a flyer for our Christmas show. Just take it out. It says the Christmas Express on it. The return of the Jedi. No, the return of the Christmas Express. Everybody get it? Just give me a wave so I know you've got it. Yeah, we need some fresh air in here. Good. This represents, it is not exclusively this, but this represents what I believe is a God-given opportunity for every single person who's part of Audacious Church to be deployed 
this season, we know it starts on the 1st of December when we do the big sing and we have hundreds of primary school children performing on this stage with their parents and their teachers in the room. And then, you know, the big give and, and the, the carol service with the candles and all of that. And this, this all represents a God opportunity for us to look at our friends at work again through the lens of compassion. To look at that person that maybe even irritates you in your family. And perhaps your boxing day will be different this year because you look through the lens of compassion and you go, you know what, I'm going to interact. I'm going to get my faith out of the box. (sighs) I'm going to blow the dust off because I never really show it here at work or I never really show it here in the common room at college. I never really show it, but it's going to become a feature in my life and I am going to invite somebody. Come and see. Yes, come and see the church, kind of. And I love our church. I'm proud of our church. The stuff that we do is just breathtaking. Like the, the, the way the creative team operate is like, let's face it, it's, it's like second to none. It's brilliant. But what we're really saying is come and see my Jesus. Come and see a man who knows everything about me and yet still loves me. So much so that he died for me. Yesterday I was listening to a leader talk about a really simple exercise where you draw a circle on a blank piece of paper and you just fill it with the names of the people that God has put in your life. The good, the bad and the ugly. Those that you're thankful to God for and those others. (laughs) But he said write them all down and then put that on your fridge, put it on your on your, uh, on your mirror, put it somewhere so that every day through the lens of compassion you can look at these people and say, all right, they may not be, they may not be, you know, it may be the, the sort of uh, raggy dolls group of friends in comparison to someone else's, but this is, these are the people that God has put in my life. And so I'm going to interact with them and I'm going to invite them. Stand to your feet and hold your invitation in your hand. Out in the foyer, there's stacks of invitations. Stacks of invitations. And we want you to, we want you to take a handful. And we want you for these next few weeks. I know it's only the beginning of November. And you're like, some of you are thinking, don't be talking about Christmas yet. I've not even bought my fireworks for Tuesday. But listen, over the last five years in particular, before that as well, but over the last five, it's almost like the hand of God has just, has just put something powerful on, on the Christmas season in our church. In fact, Pastor Glynn said it years ago when we had a visit from our friend um, Ray. What's Ray's surname from um, California? Ray Johnson. Our friend, he's a pastor in California and he challenged us to reclaim Christmas, like take it back Christmas belongs to the church not an exclusive private party I I don't mean that, I mean Christmas can be hijacked by materialism and and Christmas sales and, and gifts and the latest this, that or the other but there is a church in fact more than one, there are churches in this city that say Christmas belongs to us let us tell you all about it and guess what Thank God, like me, you don't have to be in the choir. You can be. Well, I don't know. Ask Helen, she'll tell you. Oh, the answer's no. Sorry. (laughs) You know what? Tonight, actually, I think, I hope this is true. Juliana, you're going to share your story tonight, right? So in our service tonight, we've got three next, what we call next-gen preachers, three of our new wave, our, our revolutionaries coming through. George is doing it. Who else is doing it? Peter, and they're also Juliana. And Juliana is preaching on my third point invitation. She's going to tell the story of how someone invited her to church and the change that it's made. And I've told you before about the night my dad became a Christian. He was the only one that raised his hand. You know, we do that prayer at the end of raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus. He was the only one that raised his hand. And the preacher was probably disappointed. Oh, only one tonight. Maybe in the kitchen at home. His wife's like, oh, you preach well. Well, you know, I did okay. It was only one hand tonight. But that night, God invaded my family tree. And there are generations 
I'm not blowing my own trumpet. I'm just telling you the impact of, a, of an invitation that transformed Juliana's life and also did my father's meant that we were born, me and my brothers, into a home where Jesus was not a box that we put away at Christmas. Our faith was part of who we were and we grew up. And when I turned 16, I received Jesus for myself. I got baptized. I received the Holy Spirit. I felt called to ministry. And since then, for 30 years, I've been waking up in the morning and somehow thinking, how can I tell people about Jesus? How can I build the church? That happened because somebody, my mom, invited my dad to church and somebody threw out an invitation and said, if you want to know Jesus, to which my mom was saying, plus also if you want to go out with me, I think that was in the equation somewhere. <laughs> then raise your hand and my dad raised his hand. So this what you have in your hand is no small thing. Because think about the generations. My kids, my kids growing up in a house where Jesus is part of the conversation. He's not just part of the conversation. He's, he's in the driving seat. He's, he's, he's on the throne. He's in the middle. He's at the top. So take your flyer. And for 30 seconds, I want you to think about who. I'm going to pray for you and who. I'm praying for the you and the who. You will have courage. You will, with the Holy Spirit's help, look at life through the lens of compassion and it will cause you to interact. And then you'll have the courage to say, let me invite you. And we will see this place full, front to back, left to right, five, six times over, however many times we're doing it. Six. And we can confidently know they're going to hear the truth about the gospel. Have you locked it in? Do you know who you're thinking about? That person at work, that in-law, that neighbor? I'm going to pray before Darren comes up and closes the service by praying a second prayer. Heavenly Father, for every single person in church this morning and those that are watching online, I pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit for something from heaven to be deposited in us so that we can see through the lens of compassion and that will compel us to act. And people will interact with our faith in a new way, in an unconventional way, in an in a unpredictable way that's different this time. And then with courage, we will extend an invitation to come and see a man who changed our lives. And that the fruit of this will be as it always is every January and February we will see hundreds people doing alpha people getting baptized people people coming to church and experiencing your presence God we're believing that this service this flyer this invitation will be a catalyst for supernatural change in this city and beyond in Jesus name Thank you for listening to the Audacious Church podcast. For more information, visit audaciouschurch.com.